This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Leo Katz, who is a professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania, also the author of numerous articles and books, um, including a bunch of classics, in this one called um, Ill-Gotten Gains, um, Evasion, Blackmail, Fraud, and Kindred Puzzles of the Law. This one here, Bad Acts and uh, Guilty Minds, Conundrums of, of the Criminal Law. And of course, this one, you know, why the law is so perverse. And I would have to say that for someone reading these three books, if they had to guess what area of law you specialize in, I think they would be hard pressed, right? You know, is he a criminal law guy? Is he a property law guy? Like, you know, there's so many different areas of law that you explore. I think you sort of have this, this restless uh, curiosity about the law. And I found in this book, uh, Why the Law is So Perverse, you, your curiosity ranges into the domains of of political science and and decision theory, and I think that the the main thrust of this book is that um, some of the things that we find so puzzling in in the law and annoying about the law uh, and uh, are inevitable, right, and unavoidable, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, the law is is trying to fulfill uh, a number of objectives, social objectives, uh, which are at many levels. Irrecon irreconcilable, or uh, there's no aggregation function that we can devise, which will uh, allow us to, to satisfy all of the different goals. And, and uh, you lean heavily on the work of uh, different voting theorists, uh, Condorcet yeah. and Borda from back in the day, and more recently, Ken Arrow and, and Amartya Sen. Uh, and I found this, this connection to be, you know, really, um, really compelling. Um, and then, you know, towards the end of the, of the book, you, you get into sort of individuals and individual decision-making. Um, so, you know, when Shakespeare said, let's kill all the lawyers, right? I mean, uh, and, and it's kind of, you know, like actors and lawyers, they're, they're a little suspicious because they, um, you know, they, they seem to be, uh, engaging in, in the pursuit of loopholes and, and, uh, and, and doing things that, that may contravene the, the public welfare. But I think you, you're, you're saying that, look, this is, this is just part of being a lawyer, right? This is something that you, you have to do. Um, so I don't know where to start. Maybe we can just start off by saying, like, how did you first make the connection between choice theory and decision theory and these conundrums that you had been articulating in the law? Um, yeah, uh, I... Um... Actually, what what got me into it uh, was was a relatively uh, self-contained, uh, smaller scale uh, a puzzle in the law uh, that had you know was was of of, of long standing and uh, for which there had been multiple explanations. Uh, and the fact that there were multiple explanations tells you that none of them was all that persuasive. And that was the puzzle of blackmail. Um, it, it you know there seemed to be pretty much universal agreement that blackmail is a terrible thing. And that let's just be clear what we mean by blackmail, uh, or rather what the paradoxical aspect of blackmail is. The classic cases where somebody threatens to disclose uh, some embarrassing secret uh, about you, which he would be free to disclose if he just wanted to embarrass you. Um, but instead of doing that, he asks you for some money in return for not disclosing it. And, and that's a crime. Not just a wrong, not just a tort, but it's actually criminalized and criminalized in a, you know, very serious way. It's not a trivial crime, nor is it one of those crimes, you know, adultery used to be a crime too, but we got away from that. And there was always unease about whether it belonged in the criminal category. About blackmail, there's never really been much unease in the sense that everybody agreed it, that's obviously a crime. Um, the puzzle about it is that, um, well, you're threatening to do something which you're perfectly entitled to do, and that's kind of how the ordinary bargains work. You're always threatening something. The mere fact that you're threatening isn't the problem. You're threatening not to sell that okay, car okay. that someone really wants. I'll, 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 stop, I'll stop buying your product unless you cut your prices, right? Well, absolutely. And uh, as long as what you're threatening is something you're, in fact, entitled to do, we've got a regular bargain. We don't call that coercion. We view it as illegitimate. In ordinary context, coercive, if you're threatening to do something you're not entitled to do. In the case of a robbery, I'll, you know, uh, 
I'll stab you if you don't give me your money. Uh, or do whatever. It could be something uh, less serious, but in any event, something I'm not entitled to do. And with blackmail, it's altogether different. Um, so mostly I, I uh, so initially there was just this, this question about blackmail and uh, the, the uh, literature that I found on it described, um, well, the accounts for it all kind of focused on the fact that there was, you know, that the classic case of blackmail involved information. Information being, uh, 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 you know, the disclosure of information was, 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 was being threatened. And so most of the explanations focused on there's something special about information and uh, uh, that needs to be policed uh, more extensively. Then as I thought about it, it looked as though this sort of problem arose in many contexts and didn't particularly involve information. Um, I mean, something like... Uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to um, persuade your son uh, to do what he's always had an inclination to do, uh, join the army or, uh, you know, buy a motorcycle or do something else he wants to do, but you don't particularly want him to do. But, you know, if I can be dissuaded for some mm -hmm. tangible benefit, that reeks of blackmail. I'm not threatening to disclose anything. I'm just threatening to do something that will displease you. Uh, but that I'm perfectly entitled to do. And you can push that further and you find all sorts of contexts in which somebody makes a threat that, well, when it's packaged with a request for, for a benefit, uh, it seems troublesome, but it doesn't have anything to do with information. Um, well, what, the other thing what, about blackmail is yeah. that if, 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 for instance, the initiator of the transaction is the the, the purchaser of the silence, then it's not, it's not blackmail, right? So if, if, if it, if I'm the one that, that says, Hey, you know what, that person, uh, I, I see that they're about to disclose something and I want to pay them not to do so that that's fine. Right. Cause it's, it's not coming as a, a, a result of some threat. Yeah. So then there was this further aspect at, at first glance, it looked like a secondary aspect of blackmail, which is, it's in fact, and not only is blackmail itself, uh, hard to explain why we prohibit it, but there are so many close cousins of it, like the situation you described, that are routine and that are not criminalized. So, for instance, this business about, um, you know, I know somebody's about to disclose something, so I, the potential victim of blackmail, though I'm not about to be blackmailed, take the initiative and then say, well, if you don't publish it, yeah, I'll pay you. And that's probably okay, this kind of bribery. Bribery. It's not even if bribery suggests that there's something illicit about it, but there wouldn't be. And then there are other ways in which something like blackmail happens all the time, akin to this, uh, which is, um, you know, uh, it's, it's fairly common for, uh, I mean, if somebody wants to accomplish blackmail these days, he will usually be not be so crude as to make the threat the way I described it. Uh, he'll have a lawyer disclose that they're about to file a lawsuit in some matter or other. And in the course of this lawsuit, there'll be discovery and certain things yeah. will have to be alleged and come out. They just want to let you know we can settle this lawsuit if you like want to. Divorce, right? So in a divorce yeah. case, all sorts of garbage comes to the surface, right? Right. And that and that's okay. Um for the most part. I mean, Michael Avenatti discovered that e even there you've got to be careful or, or uh, uh, it, it may not work. Uh, but, uh, but for the most part, this sort of quasi-blackmail in the context of a settlement negotiation works. And then the case that really drove this point home to me about the, uh, the, the oddity of that you could commit blackmail in all sorts of ways, just not the most direct way, uh, was a hypothetical that someone had suggested, which at first glance seemed kind of specialized, but then seemed to, in fact, have many ubiquitous, many, many counterparts. Um, take the following kind of situation. I know it's not quite the example he offered, but this is the way I illustrated it to myself. So I imagined uh, two actresses, um, each of which frequently found themselves, you know, competing for the same part. And one of them tended to beat out the other. And um, now I call them Mildred and Abigail in the Elgotten Gaines book. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Mildred girl grows increasingly uh, uh, jealous of Abigail, who beats her out, narrowly beats her out from many parts that they seemed kind of equally uh, suited for. 
so she tries to think of a way of keeping Abigail away from the, uh, from the audition. And at first glance, what occurs to her is straight out blackmail. She knows some embarrassing facts about you know, affairs that Bla Abigail has been having. So she thinks about telling Abigail, stay away from the additional. Well, tell your husband about this. And, you know, that would be a crime. Then an alternative avenue occurs to her by which she can avoid blackmail. She uh, sends a letter to, um, uh, to Abigail's address. Uh, due to arrive around the time of the, uh, of the audi audition, uh, she then tells Abigail that, you know, there's this letter there, uh, you know, she can do about it what she wants. And Abigail now is pinned at home, trying to div divert, uh, this letter communicating the very embarrassing information that ordinarily the threat of disclosure of which would amount to blackmail. And it's pretty clear that, well, it probably wouldn't amount to to blackmail. Um, so somehow this, this, uh, example in particular caught my attention. We actually find counterparts to this often occurring in the labor context. Um, a, uh, uh, you know, a factory owner is not entitled to say if you, if you go on strike or if you make uh, demands for extra compensation, I'm just going to close the plant, but he could let them know that, you know, um, uh, the way things are, or maybe the way he's arranged things, the factory will inevitably be driven to bankruptcy if they escalate their demands. Now he's issued a warning. It's not a threat. And by converting the threat into a warning, essentially by putting everything in place in advance so that it will happen, what, whatever you subsequently do, this simple conversion of a threat into a warning has uh, allowed you to escape punishment. Uh, now I... Uh, uh, this, um, I, I, initially I thought that this, this too was just a peculiarity of blackmail, this possibility of playing these kinds of games. And then I started to realize that it was actually emblematic of something much more widespread in the law, uh, which, uh, you know, blackmail perhaps helped to alert one too, but once you started looking for it, it really occurred elsewhere. And so this then widened my perspective to mm -hmm. the question of circumvention, restructuring, devious stratagems by which you get to accomplish what ostensibly is prohibited by the law. But if you're just clever enough about it or rather consult a, a knowledgeable lawyer, you get to accomplish the same thing. So from blackmail, they grew this larger puzzle. How do you account for this phenomenon that well, once you ask lawyers about it, I started asking lawyers about this example. I started asking them about other examples of circumvention and what they thought about it. And the most striking thing about it was the, the, um, um, both the level of disagreement and the level of confidence with which lawyers, uh, reacted to my questions about these cases, um, it might be a I mean, when, when I say these cases and well, what, what do I mean by circumvention beyond blackmail? Well, I just mean the kinds of things that, uh, well, here's, I'll give you two, two, two so examples. It's, it's about form versus substance, right? So it, it, exactly. Cause an economist, uh, economist would, would look at these things and say, well, you know, I, I, they don't see a whole lot of difference between some of these cases. They don't see any kind of clear, you know, bright lines in terms of the, the consequences. But, but, you know, economists or consequentialists who have a faith in the fundamental efficiency of the law, th they're going to try and, you know, dig deep into these and, and you know, try and find some kind of, you know, long-term incentive, right? So, for instance, whenever we see two consenting adults enter into some agreement, we, we presume it's mutually beneficial, we presume it's win-win, we presume it's Pareto improving, and so therefore we would expect the law to support it. But then when we see cases of, you know, I threaten to, you know, burn down your house and, and you pay me, I don't burn down your house, that sounds mutually beneficial, but an economist would say, oh yeah, but that encourages people to make investments in behavior and uh, technologies which are, you know, not wealth creating and so they would have a story around that but the examples that you're referring to it's it's yeah, the the consequentialist argument you'd have to go through some very strange 
mental acrobatics to, 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 to align the, the consequentialist story with, with some of the, the differences that you recognize, right? Yeah, it might be illuminating to describe the experience I had when I took some of these examples. I said some of these, let, let me just amplify a little so we have a clear picture of what we're talking about beyond blackmail. So when I talk about, um, you know, lawyerly stratagems or form versus substance or circumvention, um, I'm talking about the following kind of case. Um, uh, this, this is a, this is an uh, example, uh, suggested to me actually by Elizabeth Warren, the current Senator, who was then a bankruptcy scholar at the university of Pennsylvania. Yeah, I, I, I took my bank, I took my bankruptcy class. <laughs> that was my first law class. That was a, uh, that was an adventure. I saw her right here at Penn. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, she told me about the following strategy that often is used on the verge of bankruptcy, personal bankruptcy. Uh, you've got, you know, debts that outstrip your assets, though your assets might still be significant. You know, you have $10 million, but your debts are $50 million. Um, and, uh, you know, you would, uh, you know, declaring personal bankruptcy means you, you give up everything you own the $10 million in exchange for a clean slate and having the, you know, being relieved of the $50 million debts, but but you really would like to keep those $10 million. Well, there's the special category of exempt assets that the law quite sensibly doesn't require you to sacrifice. The idea there is even if you, I mean, personal bankruptcy means in exchange for getting a fresh start, you give up everything you own. Makes good sense, but obviously we wouldn't want to extend it literally to the shirt on your back. You don't have to Give the shirt on your back or the equivalents of the shirt off your back. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the bed you sleep in, you are probably maybe your abode, uh, uh, maybe a sort of a, a pension you have, sort of the basic prerequisites of living, you are entitled to retain those. Uh, those are usually described in qualitative terms. They're particular types of items that are deemed personal and you don't need to give those up. And so the natural strategy on the, or, or a strategy to be contemplated on the verge of personal bankruptcy is take what you've got, convert it into exempt assets, and then say, you can take everything else, which right. may be very little or nothing, nothing at all. Um, what, uh, she reported that, uh, she'd been at a recent conference of bankruptcy law judges where they were asked what they thought about this strategy called exemption planning. And about half of them thought outrageous, a fraud in the law, not to be permitted, have to be, these transactions have to be unwound and this belongs to the yes. creditors. And half of them thought it would be malpractice for a lawyer not to advise his client that this is what he had to do. <laughs> and uh, that, that turned out to be typical of uh, the reaction that lawyers tend to have to most, um, most of these circumvention strategies. Here's another one that I rather like, uh, both because of its potency and its simplicity. Um, you, um, uh, someone is visiting the United States. Uh, he has a short tourist visa, but he would like to stay. He would like to become an immigrant. Of course, he's not entitled to just become an immigrant because he wants to, but there are these special exceptions for people, for instance, who are asking for political asylum. Uh, well, he consults a lawyer. He says, I'd like to stay. Uh, is there anything you can do for me? And the lawyer says, well, you don't seem to fall into any of the existing, uh, categories of, for exceptions, but, um, uh, you know, uh, there's this political asylum category man says, well, if, you know, and I'm not a dissident, I've never had any trouble with my, albeit quite tyrannical government back home. The lawyer says, well, not so far. Uh, the man makes some sort of pronouncement that really makes him persona non grata back home. If he went back home mm -hmm. now, he'd be jailed or worse. And now he says, can I stay? Because otherwise I'll be killed. Mm -hmm. Um, that it, it's, you know, a, a, that strategy is used this sort of, um, uh, you know, sometimes called a bootstrapping strategy. Um, and of course the area of law that is most notorious for this, some we haven't mentioned so far is tax law. Uh, I mean, uh, tax lawyers might balk at this, but, um, some tax scholars have said, and that strikes me as plausible that basically all that tax lawyers do or tax accountants do is restructure a transaction mm -hmm. 
that has one form before it, mm -hmm. incurring a lot of tax liability into a form where that tax liability is, is greatly reduced. Um, it, 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 um, so those, those, those are the sorts of transactions in which, in which this question about circumvention comes yeah. up. No, when I, I mean, when I, think, I first I think about, I think, I think about corporate law as, as sort of the, you know, I know that area the best and. You know, there, the idea of, you know, judgment proofing yourself is, is one that it, it seems to be all about form and, and less about substance. So for instance, if you're trying to, you know, pre prevent, um, you know, piercing of the veil, if you're trying to prevent, uh, uh, consolidation, you know, you, you, you do these steps, you, you make sure that you record the moments of your board of directors and, and you make sure you don't mix all of the accounts, but, but whenever the court's talk about, you know, why it's okay to violate that. They say, well, if this was done purely for the intent of, uh, you know, getting around the, the, the idea of liability, then it's not okay. But then the way they determine, you know, your intent is by looking at the, 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 the actual form of the steps that you took. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit disturbing to economists, but it's sort of par for the course for lawyers. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, uh, proofing yourself, I mean, uh, uh, minimize, protecting your assets from potential liability creditors, of course, yes, one of the, one of the primary examples of this sort of maneuver. And um, I mean, the, the, the simplest illustration of it works much like incorporation, but even, even simpler to understand is, is just something that um, it's just simply avoiding an employer wants to avoid tort liability for the actions of his employees. Ordinarily, he's liable for the actions of his employees, but you can, if it's one thing, if they're employees, but suppose they're independent contractors. Can't really hold someone liable for what an independent contractor does. I mean, you, otherwise, anytime you purchase, anytime you do anything, have any, anyone do anything for you, you'd be liable for what he does if he does something wrong. So you can't have that. But it's pretty easy often to, you know, restructure a relationship so that the person is not your employee, but your independent contractor. And, and, and that way you've avoided liability, even though you've basically kept, kept everything the same. Uh, I, I want to get back to sort of a little sociological observation I made when I started asking my colleagues about these cases and what they thought about them, because there was a pattern to their reaction. Uh, there was one group that thought, yeah, it's true. These are maybe superficial differences, but they're differences. They make all the difference in the world. That's the way the law works. That's the way it ought to work. Um, the people who were who tended to take this view tended to work either in the procedural area, civil procedure, criminal procedure or in areas of law like criminal law that had sort of a heavily moral tinge to them. Then there were the people on the other side, the lawyer economists, and to them, their initial reaction was, I mean, subsequently they qualified it a bit in just the way you did. Their initial reaction was it's absurd. Just demonstrates how, how silly the law is and how in need of economists, the lawyers are, to straighten out this silliness. Totally indefensible. Then sometimes they backed up a little and started to tell sort of more convoluted stories about administrative ease and, and incentives and so forth that maybe might account for these oddities and make, make sense of them. And then there was a category that was in between, that was kind of schizophrenic. Uh, those were the people who worked in tax law, who often come from the economics area, but who at the same time, of course, they're in the business of teaching these strategies. So uh, their reaction was hardest to make sense of, uh, or rather they, they, they were the ones who worked hardest to try to come up with some background story, something from my point of view, a little bit of an epicycle to justify what from an economist, what, what their economist part of the mind suggests that didn't make any sense. Uh, and, uh, and it was often striking that the very same cases they had, um, the most fervent usually fervent opinions about, but on opposite sides of the line. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite example of this was, uh, I gave them the following kind of case that frequently arises, both arises in the corporate and the individual context. Uh, I imagine this man who ran a little business, 
uh, and uh, he uh, uh, was making a gift to his son every year of some small sum of money. Um, and, uh, you know, he has to pay income tax on all of his income and the fact that he gives some of it away to his son. So I imagine, you know, he's, the fact that he gives, let's say, $10,000 away to his son every year uh, it doesn't mean that uh, he doesn't have to pay taxes on that $10,000, though he would prefer if his son paid the taxes because his son is in a lower tax bracket, but that's not how it works. Now, suppose he restructured this transaction a little. One year, he gives his son $100,000, uh, borrows this $100,000 back, and then pays interest of $10,000 on that same $100,000. So he were back to the starting gate, except now the $10,000 has been kind of relabeled. It's, it's interest that he pays on a loan that he got from his son. Mm -hmm. And now it's a different story. The son has to pay income, uh, income tax on the $10,000 much at a much lower rate than the father did, and the father can deduct it. Uh, you know, let's just say leaseback transactions in the corporate context basically, basically work like that. Seems like pure magic, but, you know, it has that effect. And some people told you, of course, it's preposterous to allow this. And others say, yeah, 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 how can you not? Um, and it's, it's, if one tries to apply, I mean, and some people, of course, try to deal with this by applying the tests that you suggested. Well, let's just focus on why they did it. Did they have a real reason, an economic reason, or was this driven by a... Uh, 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 by legal motivations, by legal mm. strategy. And if that's the intent, well, then, you know, that's how we ought to distinguish. It's an uneconomical transaction if, if, if that was, if, if, if the intent was simply to dodge the law. Uh, if you've got a real reason, that's a different story. Um, it, it's, it, it, that turns out not to be a very uh, helpful test because <laughs> there are lots of times you do things because of the law and it would be strange to say it's, it's objectionable. You avoid breaking the law because there's criminal liability. We don't say, well, now it's a law-driven transaction and therefore you are to be treated like a criminal because but for the law, you would have done it. So, uh, it, 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 so, so that test doesn't, doesn't work terribly well, um, which then leaves on with the question, so what, 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 what should one do about this business that's often called loophole exploitation of the law? Yeah. Well, so in, in, I mean, in this book that you, you talk about how loopholes are, are inevitable and there's no way around, you know, the creation of loopholes, but you, you highlight a couple other things that are interesting. So for mm -hmm. instance, this idea of discontinuities and how the law has all of these, you know, discontinuities where you're, you're either liable or not liable. You're either guilty or not guilty. You're, you're doing something that's either legal or illegal. Whereas, you know, the underlying reality is somewhere in the middle. But we don't really, we impose a discontinuity on top of a, a continuity. That's, that's a puzzle. Um, and I, I think you, you tie all of these puzzles together with this underlying framework. And, I, and maybe I'll call it the, the, the cat's impossibility theorem. Are we allowed to do that? Are we allowed to say that? You don't say it. But, but I think you, 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 you make this, this point that um, there's, just, there's just no way that we can ultimately satisfy all of the different objectives that we have uh, it, it for a legal system. Now, now this is, others have made this point, not quite in the same way that you do. So how is this, your, your approach different from say the approach that we've all encountered, you know, related to the, say the trolley problem, right? I mean, we've got deontological intuitions, we've got utilitarian intuitions and, you know, they're, they're in conflict and there's nothing we can do about it. I, I think, you know, you're making a, a much more ambitious claim, right? Um, could, could you, could you kind of highlight how you arrived at this, this claim and, um, you know, how it relates to this idea of, of voting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, uh, no one would, would, uh, quarrel with the proposition. I think this would be sort of be accepted as, you know, conventional wisdom that, um, there are all sorts of, um, trade-offs that one might have to make in passing a law and that, um, you know, competing, uh, objectives, uh, can't always be perfectly attained. Uh, and, um, and, 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 and finding, 
disturbing aspects in the law as a result of that wouldn't particularly disturb economists and wouldn't particularly disturb consequentialists. Because I think, I think those folks, I mean, an economist would say, oh, well, what we really need to do is come up with some kind of ultimate aggregation function, right? Some kind of utility function which incorporates the, the, the different um, objectives into some meta objective function that tells us when we ought to pursue the one and when we want to pursue the other. And I think you're saying that that's, that's fundamentally impossible. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so, so there are, uh, so, so the, 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 I think what I was just describing, uh, is sort of both the common sense and the consequentialist and the economist views of dilemmas, um, where, uh, where do, yeah, you know, we're going to do the best we can. To, we we're going to weigh mm -hmm. different desiderata against each other and decide which are most important uh, uh, among them to us. And and uh, uh, that's uh, that's how we're going to design our law. And if that were the case, I mean that that would be. Um, uh, I, I, if if the law looked like that, the trolley problem wouldn't particularly be a problem. Uh, because in most such situations, the trolley problem being this case of this trolley that heads down a track, and uh, if we uh, just let it go, it's going to run over five people. But if we divert it to the side, uh, it's going to kill one person, then we will have saved the five. And then there are many other situations uh, of a you know more controversial nature where we can save many at the cost of killing one. Uh, and... Um, and from the consequentialist point of view, uh, you know, uh, putting to the side sort of certain systemic difficulties, if this becomes known, they would say everything else being equal, that's what we ought to do. It's a dilemma in the sense that it's unfortunate that someone has to die, but it's not really a dilemma for decision making in that it's kind of clear what makes sense. Now, what's so striking about the law is that uh, it tends not to do that. In the uh, in many cases, it forbids this sort of trade off, uh, and then of course the law has many other features that turn out to be, you know, of a piece with 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 deontology, including this business about being able to circumvent a law by being clever about it. That is actually kind of an aspect of deontological morality because deontological morality emphasizes means over ends. And once you emphasize means over ends, well, that basically the flip side of that is you can play games by changing the means and getting getting to the same end. Um, and which is why the consequentialist tends to be averse to it unless you can tell a very unusual story about why there should in this particular context be a focus on means because of the ultimate effect on ends. Um, now, uh, the way voting came into this is... Um, uh, well, the 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 presupposition here of the of the uh, economist in all of this um, is that um, the sensible way to design the law is to decide what we want. Could be multiple objectives, but nonetheless objectives that can be weighed against each other, and we decide which is more important under which circumstances. And we try to do the best we can to maximize whatever objective we've identified, often conveniently designated as efficiency or welfare and so forth. Maybe welfare incorporating all sorts of, uh, you know, non-pecuniary uh, or even unusual considerations. But in any event, it's ultimately trying to get the most of what we want. So there's like expressive. So there's the whole idea of expressive utility, right? Which you... You know, the law is sort of making certain um, representations about what's important to society and so forth. That's how you would integrate some of the some of the features. Right. Right. Now, if we if we have that. Um, so so uh, one of the things that, in fact, I didn't see this so clearly yet uh, or but uh, at all clearly only had, had a partial glimpse of it when I was working on why the law is so perverse. And this is really an outcome of subsequent work I did with with Alvaro Sandroni. Um, who had been working on related problems in the domain of psychology, trying to explain non-consequentialist decision-making in the psychological realm, which often is described as irrational, 
And he tried to explain why actually it might not be irrational at all, or at least to model it in a satisfactory way. And the models that he had come up with turned out to be very helpful in, in, understanding, uh, in understanding law. And in, the, the salient feature of the models he had devised was that they could not be described, that decision-making could not be described as maximization. Mm -hmm. It involved perfectly sensible, rational decision-making that nonetheless could not be described by a utility function. And as soon as we have decision-making that cannot be described by a utility function, all sorts of peculiarities will manifest themselves, both in the psychological realm and in its counterpart in the legal realm. So I think, I mean, to, to, so, so this would, so arrows and possibility theorem in short, basically says that, you know, even if you have a bunch of individuals who are conformed to what an economist would call rational, you know, when you try and put them together and construct a, a, a kind of a aggregate preference function, you can frequently result in what we might consider irrational preference orderings, right? That's the idea. And so this, this idea is that, well, an individual is really kind of like a committee of different <laughs> objectives and, and preferences and criteria. And, and so each of those individual criteria that the individual is concerned with may have uh, a, a rationality about them, but when they try to put them all together, and uh, put them into practice, there's, there's going to be what it looks like irrational preference ordering, right? Right. Uh, now, the economist's reaction to that in part is, well, uh, that may be true of collectivities, but the fact is a sensible person shouldn't act like a collectivity. If he's got, uh, you know, a bunch of different, uh, different rankings and he needs of, of under different criteria and he needs to aggregate them, uh, you know, he, he, he should basically use a sort of consequentialist calculus. That's the sensible way to proceed because otherwise all sorts of absurdities will result. You know, the most extreme absurdity being that he's going to be very intransitive. Uh, and so he, he'll become a money pump. He'll, he'll choose A over B and B over C, but also C over A. And so he's, he's subject to exploitation. So when you're an individual making decisions, and indeed, even if as a group, uh, you ought to try to figure out a system that uh, does create a utility function. Now, um, th so then the question is, what, uh, what would a law look like that in fact maximized the utility function in the way that economists and people modeling law and economics have insisted? And uh, why exactly is it that our law, if it doesn't look like that, doesn't look like that? And that, with the help of Alvaro Sandroni's models, uh, I think we were able to show relatively clearly. So if one wanted a law that worked, that, that could be represented as maximizing something, it would, be, it would necessarily have to have the following look. All possible options that um, a citizen, someone might have to choose between, would have to be susceptible to being ranked in terms of desirability according to whatever criteria we decide are relevant, they can be ranked. The citizen then faces a subset of those and he shall choose the one that's most desirable. Of course, there can be lots of ties. So then he's got discretion among equally desirable ones, but that's the limit of his discretion. Now, very quickly, one sees when one looks at particular legal doctrines that they couldn't, that they don't at all conform to this. And what's more, they don't conform to this for um, reasons that, well, let me give you an example of how they don't conform to it, and then you'll see why it's hard to say, well, let's just change them. Obviously, the law is irrational. Um, take something really, um, you know, relatively simple, like the defense of duress in, uh, in criminal law. So the defense of duress provides that, you know, if you're faced with a sufficiently dire threat like being tortured, unless you commit a crime or help somebody commit a crime, uh, well, you've got an excuse. Uh, somebody says, help me in this bank robbery. You've got this unique skill, you know, breaking into safes. Uh, you try to refuse. He threatens you with great physical harm or with great physical pain. Uh, if you then yield, um, understandably, you, you're excused. Um, now, you don't get the duress defense lightly. 
uh, for certain things, you won't get it. So if he threatens to, you know, uh, hurt your puppy or uh, destroy a work of art you've spent a lot of time on or a manuscript you've, you've completed, um, I mean, that may be very important to you, but you won't get the duress defense if you say, I had to do it because otherwise this would have happened. Uh, now, uh, the uh, clincher here is, uh, suppose you are someone who, um, uh, uh, you know, suppose you face the choice at some point between, uh, you know, harm to your puppy or your work of art or your manuscript or suffering great pain. Well, you're entirely free to decide which of those two you want to do, and it wouldn't be irrational. I mean, people all the time, of course, decide to incur great risks and pain and so forth in order to protect these kinds of assets. Well, the fact that, and it, and it makes all of these decisions on the part of the law make sense, that you get the duress defense for one, for a serious threat, that you don't get the duress defense for a less serious threat, and that it should be up to you how to, you know, the Pareto optimal decision uh, is for you to decide between two alternatives if you are the only affected party. But when you put these things together, you've got a set of alternatives that can't be represented by a utility function because your choice among these is actually going to be intransitive. It's going to be cyclical. You will end up choosing, you might end up choosing pain over harm to your puppy. Uh, you will end up choosing committing the bank robbery over suffering the pain. But as between the bank robbery and uh, harm to your puppy, you, you respect moral constraints, legal constraints, and you therefore uh, accept uh, harm to your puppy over, over committing the bank robbery. Well, if law could be represented by a maximizing function, that wouldn't happen. They, these three alternatives would be ranked. You would be required to choose the topmost. You'd never end up acting intransitively. And the duress defense isn't unique. Now, what's so striking here about the duress defense is it's, it's not that, um, it's quite evident that there's no irrationality on the part of the law. It's not that people don't sort of haven't fully reflected on what they're doing and how their choices hang together. It's just that we've got these, all three of these moral commitments seem quite strong. It's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, one could try to restore linearity or the possibility of, of a linear non-transitive ranking by giving up one of those, except it's very hard to give up one of those. Uh, so it seems what the law in fact has done is give up on, in, on transitivity. So I said, you know, we're going to kind of have our uh, cake and eat it by, yeah, we're going to be intransitive um, and it's not going to be the end of the world. And of course it has not been the end of the world, but so it's, you know, given the that, that duress is not a unique situation and that lots of doctrines work like this, the law now doesn't have this, the, the way the law deals with dilemmas is not the way the economist or the consequentialist initially thinks is the sensible way, but instead by accepting intransitivity. Mm. And dealing with dilemmas by, by accepting intransitivity means we're kind of in a different world than that of ordinary consequentialist rationality. We're not in a world of irrationality, but we're in a world that actually pretty much tracks deontological morality. So it's not as though deontological morality often looks like, uh, you know, just sort of we're caving into our intuitions and uh, that's kind of all we can say in behalf of it. But once you look at these examples of it, it's not quite just a matter of caving into our intuitions. It's, or rather, we've decided that transitivity is less important than our commitment to these other things. Not a silly judgment, but it has. But once you give up on transitivity, any system of rules that gives up on, trans on transitivity is going to have a mighty peculiar look to it. A peculiar look that happens to more or less coincide with the peculiarities of the law. And that's, you know, yeah. Well, one example, you, you talk about, say, tradable emission rights, right? So, you know, economists are, are they, they can't figure out why there is resistance to things which appear to be so obviously beneficial, right? Like we, 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 we want to reduce pollution and we want to do it at the lowest cost possible. And we've got a technology which, you know, enables it at, and it's relatively easy to administer. We've kind of figured it out. We know the technology and, you know, we, we can monitor and, and all the, all the normal excuses for not doing it, like, um, 
you know, information costs and transaction costs, you know, we kind of figured that out, but there, there's a, there's a resistance to this, um, because it seems to violate some other, uh, objectives that, that we have. And so it's essentially saying, well, we don't like pollution, but we're willing to put up with it. Uh, uh, even though by putting up with it, we're, we're overriding the kind of mutually beneficial transactions that, that could occur where, you know, no one seems to be harmed in any other way than it, you know, our, our, our kind of moral preferences are, are, are violated in some way. Right. I mean, it's to, this is probably the area where, where, um, uh, economists are most uh, puzzled and offended. The wide range, and it's not just a small set of transactions that the law prohibits where none of the obvious or sensible economic explanations make sense. Both parties want it. No one else is hurt by it. Uh, they know what they're doing. So it's not a case of, you know, incompetence or, and then, and, or even something more elusive, unequal bargaining power. It just uh, seems a you know it's it's a, it's a win-win transaction with no one out there who could possibly object except maybe on the grounds that they feel offended and that's a peculiar ground to economists, quite sensibly I think. And so they react and, and and just you know it, it's in, in emission rights it, it now looks as though the debate at least has been sort of settled in favor of the Pareto principle and and allowing at least some such trading but you know selling of organs pretty much still off limits, um, or, um, in contract law issue arises, whether you can, um, uh, contract for specific performance, you know, there used to be this perfectly mm -hmm. permissible, um, transaction in, in colonial America called indentured servitude, mm -hmm. uh, which people now associate with slavery and the like, it was nothing of the sort. It was that, um, when an employer wanted to bring over someone from the old country. Uh, and, uh, you know, they didn't have the money to pay for passage. So the, uh, the family that hired them would pay for passage and they would, you know, uh, stay on, uh, as servants for a, a certain amount of time. Uh, nothing problematic about that. The only problem was what to do if they ran away. Uh, ordinary contract remedies don't do much out of these circumstances. Ordinary contract remedies are, they have to pay damages, but since they don't have assets, you know, what are you going to do? So the only way this would work is if you could force, if you could ask the law, the, the courts to force them to return to their previous employment called specific enforcement of a contract. Uh, and you know, the law at some point took the position where well, we don't do that. We don't force people to do something. We force them to pay, but we'll never force them to do something. Um, well, here we've got, I mean, that was. In, in many contexts, that's not particularly beneficial to the two parties who want this kind of commitment mm -hmm. and third parties aren't hurt. Uh, and yet the law prohibits it. And there's no dress of this. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the economists, when they've written on it, sort of say, well, there are these taboo transactions. Um, it's sort of a superstition that seems to be associated with them. And, um, it makes no sense. Ideally, we would abandon it. Uh, maybe we have to work around it, but uh, but really, there's there's no good justification for it. Well, uh, that's, it's sort of. I mean, the idea of consent is something that you can, you know, in some cases, you can withdraw your consent, you know, up to some point, right? And so you you it's you cannot commit yourself, you, you because regardless of how explicit your consent is, you can kind of revoke it at any moment, right? Right. So, I mean, you've got different kinds of consent problems. One is you can't trade it at all. And then others, you just can't give it in advance. Um, mm -hmm. You can always, you know, it has to be contemporaneous consent. But if it has to be contemporaneous consent, I mean, that un often undoes the point of the bargain, as in the case of uh, these, these, these contracts for performance of a, of a service. And now the example I particularly like of a, a forbidden transaction, because, it, because I found it's the transaction most uh, helpful in getting economists to hesitate and to wonder uh, is a somewhat esoteric one. Well, esoteric, esoteric only because no one would contemplate it. Although, as far as I can tell, uh, no one could tell me why they wouldn't. And it's it's the it's the uh, transaction, a uh, consensual transaction with which I opened the book, and that's uh, the case of voluntary torture. 
that is suppose we we could make our uh, penal system a lot more efficient without making it obviously more inhumane, at least by the consequentialist lights, by saying uh, any will you know torture is a lot cheaper as, as a means of punishment than jailing people. Of course, terrible thing. So we're not going to impose that on anyone. Um, uh, but we're going to give them the option. If they want to abbreviate their sentence, we'll substitute only if they want to. I mean, it, under conditions where it's quite clear that they're really just, it's, it's their choice and they can back out any time. But if they volunteer for some severe torture, which will make only mildly less attractive than serving the sentence so that we preserve as much deterrence as we pretty much had before, they can, you know, opt for this. It, to them, it'll be a little like, you know, uh, a medical treatment, a painful medical treatment that relieves them of some long-term disability in, in, in return for this very short-term discomfort. Well, I mean, haven't there been conversations about kind of chemical castration as an alternative to, you know, lengthy jail terms for sex offenders? Uh, and, and well, so absolutely. So, so that's, that's about the flaws in it. And even this yeah. relatively mild thing, uh, which of course is just, you know, it, so, so there is not pain. There are other, and other disabilities being substituted. Uh, and, it's, and it's much easier to in, intuitively accept even that by and large, has been very controversial. But my more extreme suggestion, you know, I think it's, it's, it's off the table for everyone. I certainly wouldn't particularly embrace it, but, but it's a bit of a mystery, kind of like blackmail, because none of the standard explanations for why we would uh, prohibit a consensual transaction seem to apply. You know, it's not that the parties don't know what they're doing. It's not that third parties are adversely affected. Um, uh, it might look at first glance as though it's coercive, but it's not particularly coercive because we're entitled to keep them in jail. We only give this to them as an option. Um, and yet we object to it. Um, now, uh, it turns out that in a, in a regime that is non-maximizing, uh, one of the more hidden features of it, or at least not immediately apparent features of it is, it's also going to end up at times violating the Pareto principle. It's also at times going to either make plausible or indeed at other times make unavoidable, uh, prohibiting certain consensual transactions. So yes, one of the further, one of the further oddities, one of the further perverted per perversities that results once you accept that there's intransitivity in the law, once you accept that it can't be represented by a maximizing function, you end up with plausible situations uh, in, which, um, in which a transaction that the two parties want and no one else objects to nonetheless ends up being prohibited. Yeah. Now, when, when you're talking about loopholes, you, you talk about this mismatch theory, which I, I found very, you know, it's very appealing, um, particularly if, if you have a sort of a, background in statistics, right? Cause it's kind of like you talk about these type one errors, type two errors, and you know, it's, it's inevitable that if, if, you know, if you try to be, if you, if you try to be, uh, as maximally prohibitive, you're, you're ultimately going to make some errors. And if you're minimally prohibitive, you're going to make some, some errors. Um, and, and so, you know, just understanding those, those trade-offs, um, helps you to figure out why there kind of has to be some, wiggle room around the edges, right? Um, let me take a little bit of exception to that. Um, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's certainly true. You know, rules are always going to be imperfect. Uh, and so we get exactly what you describe as type one and type two errors, over-inclusiveness, under-inclusiveness. And for a long time, people have thought, and in particular, consequentialists and economists, that that's really what's going on when lawyers engage in these strategies that we talked about early on. They just, you know, because rules have been, a loophole is basically a mismatch. And, and, and that story, story says that, oh, once we've identified, oh, we, we just, you know, slightly adjust the rule and then we learn some new stuff and then we, we're just kind of try and come up with a rule that is not overfit, not underfit, but we're just going to keep, you know, iteratively kind of refining the rule so as to minimize the error rate across the board. That would be the story of the, of the mismatch, right? 
Right. And, and maybe sometimes we can't do it because, you know, it's just too hard to administer, but you know, nonetheless, basically it's, it's just, and, and, and it, it, it would explain why we think so uh, badly of the lawyer who exploits this loophole, because, you know, we're helpless. He really knows what the real rule ought to be. And he takes advantage of the fact that we can't, you know, express it well enough or administer it uh, uh, punctiliously enough. Uh, no one, I, I've, that seemed initially self-evidently right. How could one possibly quarrel with that? And certainly it sometimes is, uh, applies. What made me have second thoughts about it is that there are in fact lots of domains that resemble the law uh, and in which these sorts of maneuvers take place that look like exploitation of a mismatch between rule and underlying idea, spirit, rationale. But the explanation doesn't really work. The, 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 the realm that first uh, uh, drove this home to me was what religious people do. Uh, really, you know, uh, faithful people uh, who, uh, I mean, for instance, you know, many, many religions have this prohibition against usury, which people take seriously, can't exact interest. Uh, none of them, however, find it particularly problematic to do things that, you know, get around this very readily. You, uh, um, you know, you make someone a partner, uh, the investor uh, or, or something even uh, uh, funnier that call the Mohatra contract, whereby you sell an asset to someone, the would be lender, and you agree in advance that it's going to be sold back to you at a larger amount, namely the original amount plus the interest. And this works like collateral, basically. So it's really a disguised loan and people don't feel particularly, religious people don't feel uneasy about doing that and will often, in fact, you know, pre consult their, their rabbi or their priest um, for advice on how they might do something that, you know, is, would violate a religious prohibition, but how could they get around that? Now, if you want to explain that with a mismatch theory, it doesn't quite, what are they saying? You know, God just didn't graft the usury provision right. We'll wait until he does. And until then, we're free to do this. Or even ordinary morality uh, works like that. Uh, you know, the, the, the simplest example to me, uh, a rule of morality that we all, um, uh, well, where we all exploit a loophole, uh, a sort of loophole, which is the prohibition against lying. Um, we feel bad about lying. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, well, one option is to tell the truth. The other option is to just find a way to dissemble that doesn't involve an outright lie. Uh, say something that's literally true, but highly misleading, um, or, uh, play this trick. Um, uh, well, I mean, basically they'll do, 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 do the, do the functional equivalent of dissembling, but not commit the outright lie. Now, again, the mismatch theory doesn't really explain that because, you know, it's, it's our own morality. We feel better if we dissemble in this roundabout indirect way than directly. So it's not the case that somebody misdrafted the rule there. Uh, something else seems to be going on. And then the third, a third realm in which this occurs um, is autocratic regimes. People often succeed with these strategies as well. Even though you might think, well, the dictator doesn't particularly feel bound by how he expressed the rule. If, if he sees you doing something he didn't want you to do, he'll just intervene. And yet, you know, such regimes are notorious for people playing all, all sorts of games. Um, the final realm, and the one that I think is, is the most telltale, is uh, playing these games in the parliamentary context. You know? You can, you can derail a law by being very clever about proposing an amendment. Uh, the amendment gets adopted. The amended law gets proposed. The amended law then is rejected. Basically, now, now here it's quite clear. Everybody understands what's going on there as a result of voting theory. And they understand it's not a case of mismatch. It's a feature of the way voting rules or defensible voting rules work that they're inevitably going to be susceptible to manipulation. And there are, you know, very ingenious and powerful theorems that show this in the voting context. And that then suggests that, well, maybe something analysis is going on in all these other realms, including the law, 
not the mismatch, but something analogous to what's going on in the voting context. And that mm -hmm. brings us back to exactly what you were saying earlier. Uh, the, uh, maybe, maybe the law is doing something analogous to what is going on in the parliamentary context with voting, where we aggregate a variety of preferences, but not through a maximizing function, but in some other way. And essentially, it's that other way that we seek to describe for the law. And that other way uh, respects a variety of desirable constraints, but the one constraint it no longer respects is, you know, having a utility function, having transitivity, just as voting rules don't respect that. Well, this has implications for professional responsibility, right? So, you know, in, in all lawyers are expected to adhere to professional responsibility. And, you know, one possible interpretation of professional responsibility is that, you know, you should pursue justice and, you know, adhere to the substance of, of justice and the intent of, of the law. And, and, and in that case, um, we would frown on kind of activities that seem to subvert the substance, right? Where you're, you know, looking for some formulaic um, way around the substance, some kind of loophole and, and so forth. And, you know, th this would mean lawyers are just sophists trying to win at all costs and they don't care about the broader consequences. But I think you're, you're saying, well, hold on a second, right? Um, it's not so easy to, you know, understand in any objective way what the substance really is because the law contains, is essentially the product of um, multiple kind of competing objectives. And that uh, if you think of yourself more as a parliamentarian trying to ach achieve some, some, some goal, uh, you might have to engage in strategies and activities that, that don't necessarily look so, so wholesome from afar. Is that, is that, is that a fair description of the implications for professional responsibility? You say a lawyer should think of themselves more as a parliamentarian. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 I think it's, it's, it's worth there really honing in a little on that parliamentarian example, because it makes it clear why it's so hard to, to object to what, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the seemingly sophistical lawyer does. So let's suppose you know, there's a law that is, there's a reform proposal that's going to pass by a significant majority. And there are people who, you know, there's this minority that doesn't like that and wants to derail it. Uh, and the, you know, notoriously the most, one of the most successful ways of de derailing this is by proposing something like a killer amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, and that takes advantage of what's known in the voting context as the voting paradox. And the voting paradox says that sometimes when you've got multiple alternatives, the way voters' preferences line up is you could have a majority prefer alternative B to alternative A, and you could have a majority prefer alternative C to alternative B, but then not, as you might expect, that you might think that would then would mean that therefore a majority prefers C to A. No, it could be that A is preferred by a majority to C. So every alternative is one where there's a majority for it, where the, Every alternative faces a potential competitor to which it would lose, as well as a potential competitor it might win against. So the person who proposes an amendment then is taking advantage of that. He so this would be like voting in the first round of a runoff election for the person who is an extremist on the complete opposite side of what you prefer, just so that you can kind of play the end game and, and, uh, and make sure that your candidate is running against somebody that nobody likes. Right. Um, and it might even be, uh, you don't even need, it doesn't even require insincerity on the strategist's part. He might even prefer the amendment, but he says, but, but what's even better is, uh, he's not going to get the amended outcome. He's got to get, he's, he's going to just get the status quo, which is what he's really after. Mm -hmm. Um, now, on what grounds could one possibly object to it? I mean, could one say, well, the will of the people is being derailed? Well, the will of the people is, I mean, each three, each of the three alternatives is an equally legitimate or an equally poor representative of the will of the people, because there's no such thing. There's just a situation where every one of the three over available alternatives has a majority for it relative to something and a majority against it relative to something else. So you make sure that you get the alternative that you happen to like best. It's no less a democratic outcome. And, um, you know, the idea is that this is kind of how it is in, in, 
with legal strategizing as well. It looks at first glance devious because something is about to happen that looks like it's the democratic will, and you make sure that it doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Looked at from that point of view, a terrible thing. Looked at more closely, it just seems this is, if you, if you believe in majority voting, then in this case, you can't really object to what's being done. And you can't say that the outcome is a terrible one. You don't have any grounds for objecting to the outcome as a terrible one. And if law has this intransitive structure, a non-maximizing structure, then you're basically always going to be in a position to make exactly the same defense for the outcome that you've engineered through your lawyering. Um, yeah. So if, so if intransitivity is, is a, something we're, we're, that's inevitable, that also has these consequences that win-win Pareto improving uh, transactions are inevitably going to be prohibited. There's going to be some that are prohibited. Some of them, yeah. You know, loopholes are are inevitable. There's no way to kind of get around these loopholes. And then the third consequence, which you highlight, is this idea that you know discontinuities are are, are going to exist. And um, and so this is one I think that economists are particularly disturbed by because you know whenever we look at at the law, you know, we we think in terms of probabilities. We think you know. If like, think about, um, I don't know, consent to sexual activity, right? You know, it's either a rape or it's not a rape, meaning person's either going to get 10 years or, 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 you know, not. And, and then the, or zero, right? So it's either 10 or zero. And, and, you know, whereas when you look at the evidence, it's like, well, you know, maybe it's kind of half consent or maybe the evidence is such that we, we think it's 50% likely that it was consent or non-consent, but we're not, we can't impose sort of a intermediate, um, kind of judgment, right? I mean, there are obviously, in, if you do a plea bargain, there's ways to kind of essentially go somewhere in the middle, but the law itself, you know, you're either guilty or not guilty. You're either liable or not liable. And there are some exceptions, obviously with contributory negligence and so forth. But, and I think in a lot of areas, we're seeing a movement more towards these gray solutions, but, but you're, you, you can't get around it. Uh, why is that the case? Why why is that the case? Yeah, I mean, it, it on on the on the face of it, it's 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 really mystifying, and it's made more mystifying by the fact that there are plea bargains and settlements, mm-hmm. which kind of seem to do what the law refuses to do, which is to split the difference. Um, I mean, it it it. Um, I think many 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 law students, especially in their first year, are kind of driven nuts by this because they encounter these rules, and the professor tortures them with all sorts of examples that, you know, well they're constructed so that is it a case of self defense? Is it not? Well, and then at some point they throw up their hands. Well, it's you know, it's you picked it because it's kind of self defense, kind of not self defense, and uh, to all. Uh, and of course, that tends to be the case that get cases that get litigated and that we read about become litigated because, uh, well, there's lots of disagreement about them. About one thing, there is agreement. There are hard cases that you could kind of argue both ways. And then and when people, you know, decide not to go to court, it's often because they realize there's a 50 percent chance it'll go one way, 50 percent chance it'll go the other way. So we'll 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 settle on 50 percent of the damage award. But then you wonder, so why doesn't the law do that? I mean, it, it's an in-between case. So wouldn't the sensible outcome be an in-between verdict? Isn't that kind of, wouldn't that correspond to the, to the justice of the situation? But it's, but it's not what the law does. Although an increasing number of people believe it should and have argued for that and, and you know, contributory negligence uh, does a little bit of that. And they basically say, we need to extend that. And uh, the law would look a lot better. If, if we allowed these in-between solutions, not just as a product of settlement and plea bargaining, but we allowed the judge to split the difference. Um, and a, a, what, what's kind of remarkable about the history of the law is that um, notwithstanding intermittently legal scholars uh, agitating for this, the law across the world um, pretty much resolutely goes the, goes the other way. Um, I mean, so one of, one of my... Uh, favorite examples of this is um, there's this question that arises in property law about what should be done if somebody steals something Mm -hmm. and then sells it to an innocent third party. And then the original owner comes along and wants it back from the you know, what's called a bona fide purchaser for value, the innocent party who acquired we're, it. We're seeing this with artwork, right? Quite a bit now with the Holocaust, uh, art 
exactly. Uh, so, you know, we've got two innocent parties. Um, and you might think, and sort of, you know, reformers have suggested, well, they're two innocent parties, so we'll let them kind of split the difference, which we might mean not by cutting the artwork in half, but having one person get the artwork and the other and pay some money to the other innocent party. In fact, across the world, um, legal regimes basically do one of two things. They either let the original owner get his stuff back and, you know, the purchaser is out of luck or the purchaser gets to retain it and the original owner is out of luck. Just those two. The one alternative, uh, the one regime that I read somewhere does something different is, I think, Mongolian cattle law. <laughs> they cut. They cut the cattle in half. <laughs> what all of the It's 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 either or. And just uh, two years ago or something, uh, they organized a, a nice conference on this on this either or question in this, Israel. Even if, if, if even if it's a breeding cattle, I mean, presumably breeding it's cattle and, and eat food cattle are treated differently. No, it's on. It's in a footnote, I think, by an article in an article by Saul Lindmore. So. Uh, so I don't know. I haven't followed up, and I don't know whether that that information is available or not. Um, now, um, how? I well, we we Alvaro and I have an account for that that indirectly that that more indirectly connects with with this intransitivity phenomenon uh, than than these other phenomena. It's maybe not not strictly required, but it's strongly suggested. Um, uh, think about uh, the following kind of situation. Uh, you, um, uh, you're trying to, uh, you have some job vacancies that you're trying to fill. Uh, let's say they're you know, a corporation, there are 100 positions, uh, sorry, they're, 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 um, there are 10, 10 positions you're trying to fill. And you, uh, you're a committee and you uh, interview candidates. And in the end, uh, you are unanimous that 85 of them should be rejected. And you're also unanimous that uh, five of them are surefire hires. And then there are the 10 in between where there's disagreement. So what are you going to do? Um, well, it will be strongly tempting to do one of two things, to either hire just five and, you know, live with the deficiency or maybe hire 15, you know, if, 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 if that's, if that's a possibility and you're going to, the reason you're going to hesitate about doing anything in between is because that requires you to work out some plausible way of aggregating, of resolving the disagreement. And, you know, for voting theory that there's really no persuasive way of doing that. Well, there are a bunch of acceptable ways, but they all lead in different directions. We're not really in a position to sort of line up uh, the different alternative possibilities um, in, and, and, uh, in, in, in terms of desirability because we've got no good formula for aggregating these disagreements. Well, something similar um, will often arise in deciding, in deciding a legal case. Um, there, uh, you know... Uh, there, there, there would be clear-cut alternatives to which something could be assimilated, but all the in-between cases can't really be arranged uh, in a sort of or in in in, in mm -hmm. the kind of linear order that would be required if one wanted one of these split the difference regimes. And so judges end up doing you know something analogous to what the corporation here would be doing. So you can see how in this case you know the the. Um, the social choice paradigm is suggestive, even though it doesn't necessarily compel what the law does. This is the, the Chichilinsky uh, theorem, right? It's related to that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So uh, then the last point, I think you're, you're talking about kind of uh, life, right? And how we, you know, someone's either alive or dead and we don't think in terms of, of degrees. And I think the recent coronavirus crisis has um, highlighted how economists sometimes think a little bit differently about life than most people's moral intuitions when we talk about, you know, how many people were killed by, by coronavirus. And 
I think economists are more inclined to think in terms of, say, quality, right? Quality of quality adjusted life years. They would say, well, the death of a hundred year old is sort of less tragic than the death of a, you know, six year old. And 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 there's something about that way of thinking that offends, you know, some aspect of our 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 morality and our intuition. And uh I think it not only does the law kind of think of life as as an either or thing but but so too does does policy um and even though it leads to some perversities or or difficulties it's something that that we're we're definitely wedded to right yeah uh, i mean economists often uh, try to um you know derive evaluation of life by looking at a variety of different contexts you know uh, how much are people willing to pay for life insurance? Uh, what sort of risky jobs are they willing to accept? Mm -hmm. uh, when will they accept the vaccine and when not? They look at a variety of contexts in which uh, uh, people make decisions about risk. Uh, and often they are disturbed uh, by the fact that they don't quite line up. Now, that lack of lineup is actually what you would pretty much expect if our morality has the shape that the law has, or if the law is in mm -hmm. fact simply mirror image of our morality, because uh, only if our individual morality were of this maximizing type uh, would 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 we observe consistency between these different measures of value mm -hmm. of life. I mean, in a sense, in even the simple example I gave you of duress, we're basically attaching inconsistent values to life. Uh, as expressed by the fact that there is this intransitivity. Um, now, um, so, so it's, it's, I mean, my, my, my guess is that, that, um, any recommendation that an economist makes on the basis of some particular statistical model he has, um, he can be made uneasy about by, by, a, by, a, by a competing statistic, mm -hmm. um, his temptation might then be to say, well, you know, I'm just, people are just being irrational and we need to uh, com seek to get them to commit to one of these valuations. To my mind, that's kind of equivalent to saying, well, we just need to get rid of the law of the rest and the law of necessity and the law of self defense all of which exhibit these intransitivities. Um, if if it's acceptable in the law, it's hard to see why it wouldn't be acceptable in the individual morality of people. Of course, it makes policymaking a bit of a mystery. Uh, so that that's one of those things we haven't we haven't figured out yet. I mean, to some extent, at at the aggregate level, one has to probably be more of a of a, of a consequentialist. Still not a pure consequentialist. But when government does things that seem inconsistent, um, well, to some extent, they're just mirroring um, a morality which, if it were to be consequentialist, would look extremely odd. Mm -hmm. Well, Leo, I think, uh, you know, we could chat all day. <laughs> I think this is probably, uh, you know, for people out there who, who never went to law school, they, they probably are getting a glimpse of, you know, why how law school can be such a wonderful experience um, and enjoyable experience. Um, and uh, taking an entire semester-long class with you would be uh, one of the highlights of their law school experience. So thank you, thank you so much. This, this book right here, uh, Why the Law is So Perverse, uh, it's, it's really a, a fantastic read. And of course, you know, Bad Acts and, and Guilty Minds, Ill-Gotten Gains, all of these books are incredibly provocative. They'll keep you thinking for, for days, months, and in my case, years after, after reading them. I uh, hope we can continue the conversation some other time. Thanks, Leo. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 